Hello and welcome to uh, another edition of The Movie Trap. Uh, I, as always, am one of your three hosts, Zach Powers. With me are Russell Carlson. Uh, demarcation. And Chris Boroff. Howdy, howdy. And our uh, our perennial guest for this Sam Peckinpah round, it's Richard Carlson. I've, hi, nice to meet you. I feel terrible. I have divide diarrhea. <laughs> Sorry, we were doing lines from Cross of Iron. I was doing one of my favorite ones. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, as I alluded to, this is the conclusion of the... Um, might I say, rigged Sam Peckinpah <laughs> round that uh, Russell uh, Russell chose. Uh, if you're new to the show, a quick primer. The premise here is that uh, we um, uh, choose a theme on which each of our three hosts picks a movie. And after each of those three movies have been screened at the end of the uh, the trilogy, as it were, we vote on which was the best of those three films and the winner, the person who chose the, the best film gets to pick the theme for the next trilogy or round of three. And we are closing out the Sam Peckinpah round Indeed. today. Yes. And uh, just for a quick rundown of the points, because in each episode, uh, our uh, illustrious hosts get uh, three bonus points to, uh, uh, distribute among to their hosts and we've also allowed our guest uh, to give out uh, three bonus points but he is out of points I gave them all out like episode moment. two he gave them all out uh, gave them all he was he was very very generous with them however us three we have been very stingy we each have two bonus points uh, but as far as points to allocate as the end of the round for the voting Chris Boroff, you have 12 points. I myself have 11 points. And Zach Powers, you have 13 points. Okay. So, uh, real that... quick, I'm giving a point to Chris Boroff because, again, this was a round where Russell chose the theme with only 12 movies and picked probably, like, the knowingly strongest one. And, Chris, you need a little bump. You need a little I... bump to, to <laughs> you know, even the scales. It's funny that you say that because uh, great minds think alike. Due to the fact that this circumstance has come up, I want to give you a point, Zach. Oh, thank you very much. For, for giving me the opportunity to accept a point after having to watch this movie. It's it's the one uh, glowing My favorite part Russell gets the right to yeah. understand this, guys. You you know so so you put your thumb on the scales for the previous election, and on the next election, I expect all this 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 accountability. I just uh, <laughs> Russell, I, I you have I you have gerrymandered this election. <laughs> yes, the hell. yes, he did. <laughs> gerrymandered is a good word. Well, what about all the all the bunch of, of fake points that uh, no. that that Richard? Gave? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, here's the we, thing: we should have somebody that, look into that. There will be a fair count at the end, and I believe and all will. of us will be held to account at some point for having picked this particular and theme. Preemptively, <laughs> before we go into the details of this week's mm -hmm. movie, which we have not yet mentioned, uh, I will say I did enjoy "Bring Me the Head" of Alfredo uh, Alfredo Garcia, and uh, you know. Hey, there's there's a there's an outside shot. You know, 538 has a 20% chance of that that pulling an upset. I think. <laughs> hey, listen, there's like Peck and Paw, there are a lot of Peck and Paw like fans that will agree with that will say that that movie is his best film. I mean, like it, yeah. it is like it, you know, can't say the same thing about Cross of Iron. So, uh, yeah, but, we get to the uh so if that if that is the underdog of the two major political parties in this election, we come to the Libertarian Party <laughs> <in> this round. <laughs> <laughs> this week we watched Cross of Iron, uh, Sam Peckinpah's only war film. Uh, uh, as far as I'm aware, the only one that uh, his, is his only World War II film. Yes. I, I would I, like. I, I was just about to bring this up, but I was gonna, like, Major Dundee is kind of a war film because it's like even the Wild Bunch has war elements. Yeah, it, it, like even I would not consider I, if someone's considered the Wild Bunch not a, a war film, I wouldn't argue with them. But if someone considered Major Dundee not a war film, I'd be like, eh, it's more like a Western war film. But this is his first like straight up like war film, you know, and 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 yeah. So I would yeah. say like the, unlike Major Dundee, which is kind of like a a Western in a war setting, 
Whereas this is just a straight war. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I guess without further ado, we should uh, get into the basics of Cross of Iron. Yeah. Um, Cross of Iron is a 1977 film directed by Sam Peckinpah. It stars James Coburn, Maximilian Schell, uh, and James Mason. Um <laughs> Coburn stars as Rolf Steiner. Um, Schnell plays uh, uh, Stransky. And uh, Mason plays uh, the commander of the outpost, Brandt. Um, uh, quickly, to say, get this out of the way first, this is a movie about World War II told from the perspective of German soldiers. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, it's it's vaguely who was a former German yeah. soldier. Yeah, it was vaguely based off a real story. Um, so basically, the uh, movie uh, begins with a montage of images from Nazi Germany and World War II, um, mixed between a chil- German children's song and uh, occasional bouts of like very intense dramatic music as they show like the human cost um again sim peck and pa's opening credits i feel like these this is a, a common theme between the three films they have these black and white montages these freeze frames this use of music uh i've liked all three um of those um but yeah so in this particular case this very childish german song mixed with sort of grotesque images of Hitler and prominent Nazis and war and adoring fans of Hitler and things like that. Right. The, it builds up. It's, it, it's supposed to be like a prologue to this is how we got here. And it's like a prologue to kind of Hitler's rise and the massive buildup of the military in Germany, just pictures it told in picture form. Um, and really, it's 1943. We're pretty well into it. At right. This no, this yeah. is the retreat. This is, this, this is, is late in the war, late yeah. in the war. Uh, and it's the German Russian front. Uh, notoriously, if uh, uh, any of you listeners are fans of history, this was the hardest front for Germany. They lost a lot of people. Russia lost more, but they just kept fucking sending them. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so we open with a, a an assault on a Russian base in which a number of Russian soldiers are killed and a young Russian soldier is captured. And then we cut to uh, the base of the the uh, German battalion from which this assault came. Uh, it's run by James Mason and another fellow who's got a shaggy haircut and seems constantly drunk. David uh, Warner, baby. Yeah, David Warner. Yeah, that was that was one of the most exciting parts of the whole movie. I was like, oh, shit, it's David Warner. And then the rest he's of the movie. He's a Peckinpah regular, man. He's, yeah. a Peck and Paul, he's a Peckinpah exactly. company player. Yeah. Zach, you you would know him best as the voice of Raz Al Ghul from oh, wow. Batman. Okay. He was the he evil mad scientist in the second yeah. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He was I, he was the guy who helped build Tokar also, and Razor. I, I believe he I said also know him best, Richard. Know yeah. him best. If you've ever seen Waxwork, I believe he was also the guy who ran the Waxwork Museum. Yeah, he's in a bunch of stuff. Yeah, he's yeah, a he's Sam Peckinpah dude. He's been in a, he's been in more Karen than a couple of Sam Peckinpah flicks. He's awesome. Yeah, he's spectacular. Well. Yeah. This particular uh, this particular base has been saddled with a new uh, a new recruit, a new fella sent over a captain named Stransky, who is this uh, sort of R- Prussian autocrat. He's from nobility, um, serving, obviously, on the German side of the war. He requested to be transferred from occupied France uh, specifically because he is in search of gaining his very own Iron Cross, uh, you know, a, a high honor in the Nazi German military. Uh, sort of like the Purple Star or something of that nature. Mm-hmm. Played by Maximilian Schnell, I think. Maximilian Schnell plays that character. Um, so uh, Steiner, who is the guy who ran the operation that captured the young Ger- uh, Russian soldier, um, returns... Um, and, uh, he's initially ordered to just execute the young soldier by, uh, by Stransky. He, uh, relents, uh, and, he, and he doesn't. The young soldier's also like a child. Like, yeah, no, yeah, it's like I wanted 14. to say that. Like, he's a, he's yeah. a boy. He's like, like, this yeah, is yeah. like, he can't he's a child than 12. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's yeah. very, very, very young. Uh, Steiner refuses, um, but, uh, through a series of 
communications uh eventually uh they're able to spare the boy's life at least for the time being um and uh meanwhile stransky is getting to know his uh his inferiors in the front including um one lieutenant tree big um Stransky kind of has this very tense conversation with Treebig and his, I don't know, assistant. I don't know, army. His lover. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like the guy in charge. They, uh, it gets a little difficult to figure out who's in charge of whom in this movie, except uh, everybody seems to be a little bit scared of James Coburn's character. That's the only thing. Even the brass. Yeah. yeah. Even the, even the yeah. top brass. Yeah. It seems like James Mason is de facto the highest ranking person. Yeah, he's a colonel. Yes, he would be the high command. Yeah, he was the colonel. Uh, David Warner was like his like second in command. So they like him and David Warner were both the brass of uh, that particular platoon or whatever. So Stransky seems to uh, discern that uh, Lieutenant Trebig is secretly gay, um, which uh, unsurprisingly, if you were in the... Uh, Nazi army was not a good thing to be. Despite, like, most of them being. <laughs> yeah. I didn't um, know that. That's that's news. <laughs> I'm just making that up. I'm just I'm okay. slandering Nazis. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm slandering gays, actually, by comparing them to Nazis. Sorry, homosexuals. Yeah, that was yeah, not cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's worth noting this base is constantly besieged by some level of, like, shells and mortar fire. Um... You know the 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 ground on the underground bunker is const the ceiling is constantly like dropping dirt on their heads as shells hit in the hit above them. You know it's it seems like. But, uh, but, but even with all that, they still have plenty of time for long conversations. They don't seem to be too scared so about the great. shells. They just it's like mash. Yeah, it's, it's like a mash episode. They just chill and talk exactly. for a long time. <laughs> <sighs> uh, so. Uh, an attack is imminent from the Russians. Uh, Steiner, uh, in advance of the attack, tries to release the boy soldier from the Russian side, uh, but he's killed basically instantaneously by the Soviet troops who are advancing. Um, and a one of many sort of longish battle scenes begins. Um, Stransky, uh, the new the new aristocrat uh, got captain cowers under a table while um uh steiner and uh his lieutenant commander meyer. lieutenant meyer uh successfully mount a counterattack. meyer is killed and steiner is like heavily wounded uh his he gets a, a pretty grievous head wound over the course of this counterattack, and uh is immediately taken away to a military office uh, a hospital once uh once they have turned away the russians um there's a little weird dream sequence about him like st stumbling into a brook i guess it's supposed to be him at the hospital unsure of what's going on i'm not entirely sure what was going on in that segment I'm yeah really it gets it totally gets very honest. like sort of experimental and you kind of get the sense yeah, that this yeah. is probably it, supposed it, to it's, represent what he's going through as he's trying yeah, to get over his injury and sort of in and out of consciousness but some of them are actually very interesting fun sequences but it's uh, I, I think it's the coolest part of the movie yeah, i think, I I think yeah. some of the coolest parts of the movie yeah. is that him sort of going through that yeah. Uh, he is nursed back to health by uh, a woman named Eva at this uh, military hospital um, where, you know, he, he, he was in a coma. He wakes up um, and he has a number of outbursts as he is haunted by the faces of the people who have died, including the young boy he saw get killed a little earlier. Uh, there's a scene where a number of German officers come by to like hold some kind of I don't know, party or luncheon for the recovering, uh, recovering soldiers. And he kind of wrecks it and throws all the plates and, and bottles on the floor. Um, all the while his relationship with Eva intensifies. And while Steiner is offered the chance to return home and Eva had hoped that she would, he would in fact turn return home with her. He decides he has to go back to 
to the Russian front to his men at the base. Um, when he finally returns, he is informed that uh, uh, Stransky has said that he and Treberg are the two witnesses uh, that claim he and not Meyer were was the person behind the counterattack against the Russians. And for this, Stransky is going to get his Iron Cross. Uh, it's implied probably that Stransky is blackmailing Trebig. Um, um, yeah, they it's implied. Kind of, yeah, it's, it's implied. implied. Um, yeah, when yeah, that whole that whole scene where he's and and they talk about it briefly afterwards is like when he talks about um, you know thinking about Paris and everything of that nature and everything of that nature said so, yeah he's he, he's he's got. Yeah. Old, he's using the old fact tree that, over a barrel. Yeah, he's using the fact that tree bur, tree big Treyberg, tre I can't pronounce the name. Since he tree is, big. yeah, tree big. Since he's, uh, I think I've gay, mispronounced it too. But it's yeah, it's tree big, gay, like a big tree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he just turns into the cudgel by which uh, uh, Stransky will keep beating on Steiner for the rest of the movie. Because uh, if you haven't picked up on it, Stransky's not really a do-it-himself type of guy. So uh, that's exactly what happens. <laughs> no. This guy turns into the heavy of the movie. There's a scene in the earlier attack where people are being murdered re left and right, where um, he has a small cut on his forehead and he's shouting into the phone that he's been wounded. It's, you know, he's hiding under a table that's like far too small for him so he's literally lifting it on his back he's 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 a coward pretty much mm -hmm. um regardless uh eventually the top brass james mason it becomes suspicious of stransky's uh claim that he led the counterattack and interrogates um both steiner and Treebig. Uh, Treebig is kind of like waffling in his responses and Steiner is like, I didn't see that fucker anywhere. Meyer did it. But when asked again, he's like, give me a few days to, to figure out what to say to this particular line of inquiry. Um, regardless, uh, yeah, uh, at that point, uh, they press forward on their attack. Um, but... Eventually, the battalion is called back, uh, like the the entire uh, infantry is called back, um, and Stratsky, uh, realizing that uh, this guy's a threat to his Iron Cross, refuses to tell the platoon that Steiner runs, uh, leaving them behind enemy lines. Uh, specifically, uh, you know, obviously to get him out of the way so he can get his Iron Cross. Um and the next segment of the film is them making their way through now enemy controlled territory. They eventually come to like a woman's brigade of Soviet soldiers. It was at this point where I'm like, hey, you know what? We we may get out of this without a rape scene. We we may get out of this movie without a rape. And then I saw the platoon of women. I'm like, son of a bitch. Yeah. Uh, they capture yeah. the platoon of women. Uh, one of uh, one of Steiner's uh, platoon, a guy named Zoll, pulls aside one of them with the intention to rape her. Um, she, I don't know, bites off his dick, basically. Yeah, um, that's an accurate way of, just, of yeah, describing what happened. I think that's basically what happens. Yeah. Uh, and now that's how you do right, a rape yeah, scene. Yeah, no, uh, he, it took his that's last fucking film, but he did it right this the time. the fucking dick off. Uh, and he... In return, <laughs> bludgeons her to death. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, and that's and another true. another guard, another member of the platoon, is also so killed in this scene. A child, a kind of childish character named Dietz, I, who is like young, previously... not as not as young as the Russian, but young enough no. to yeah, be yeah. young. Innocent. Yeah. He was introduced yeah. in one of the earlier scenes as being fresh like to the fight. He was brand like new 19. to the front. Yeah. 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 He had a scene where he was playing a child's game where he avoided stepping on sunshine for good luck. Like, he's, mm -hmm. he's that kind of guy. Uh, he is killed uh, by one of the, uh, one of the female platoon. Um, the attempted rapist is locked up with the remainder of the Russian women. Um, they take their uniforms to disguise themselves while they... Uh, head back to the front. Yeah, they leave him to be so killed. So as they get 
Yeah, basically he is implied, heavily implied, he's going to be murdered by these people. Yeah, they they physically rip at him with his bare with their bare hands, you know, yeah. like he ain't getting out of that. So. It's a confusing thing. Like I said, yeah, it's better than the woman liking it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, the, the bar is low for Sam Peckinpah, but he cleared it for this uh, movie at least. Yeah. yeah, but, you know, he had to have his classic thing of someone ripping the shirt off. Oh, of yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, that's yeah, going to be everywhere. Know, yep. He can't help it. Uh, that's his thing that is it, his fetish it's yeah, yeah he, he dreams yeah. of that every time Just with the right up there with the slow motion death scenes and the freeze frame I, i'm willing title. to bet he's played a number of prostitutes to do that exact move i'm, I'm willing to bet that is oh, an God. actual thing yeah <laughs> so they managed to make it back to the front lines they called ahead to say don't shoot at us we're disguised as russians but we are in fact german soldiers uh stransky orders Trebrig to um ignore that command and kill them anyway which they do for the most part they kill the vast majority of them but uh, obviously steiner and a couple others managed to get through the onslaught at which point uh, Trebig says that he had nothing to do with him nothing to do with the uh the the friendly fire but steiner shoots him to death regardless uh and names another fella to you know take control of the platoon he then uh, manages to find Stransky uh, just as the Russians are arriving for another attack. And rather than killing him, he gives him a machine gun and says, you know, I will take you to where the Iron Crosses grow. And Stransky seems to accept. Uh, he's like, I'll show you how uh, an aristocrat fights. They both go out into the <laughs> battlefield. Yeah. Yeah. They both go out to the battlefield um, and Stransky is immediately overwhelmed. He doesn't know how to reload his gun and Steiner bursts out laughing while another very young Russian soldier shakes his head watching. Um, Oh, those goofy, those goofy Germans. Yeah. Uh, And and the credits begin to roll over the laughter and a uh, reprise of the German children's song that opened the film as well as images, real images of uh, civilians, mostly who were hung uh, during the reign, the Nazi regime. Yeah, intercut with I Vietnam. A couple of pictures. Inter- intercut yeah, with Vietnam. Vietnam. Yep. Oh, intercut yeah, with Vietnam. Vietnam. Would, yeah. I don't, would don't you, think that was an accident. No, absolutely not. Just to, I know we're about to go into questions. Just to volley it out there since you just said it. How did you guys feel about that ending? I thought it felt pretentious. I felt like it was unearned, at least. The showing those the images were, has to say. were unearned. So how did you guys feel? How did that play for you? I didn't love it, um, but I'm sure Richard is going to tell me why I didn't love it, because I know there's a very specific reason uh, for the ending of this film. Uh, I, but I don't uh, think the film was necessarily strong enough as a whole to justify it. I think I understand Mm. what he was going for. And I think it was very similar to say what Spike Lee did with black Klansmen a few years ago. Okay. But I kind of get that. Yeah. yeah. Where, I mean, he's, he, you didn't get to the point that cross of iron is Vietnam. He hammered it home with the credits and the laughing and the children singing. Well, that's what I think. the, The, well, so the reason why it, it, the end, the original ending wasn't supposed to be that way at all. The reason why it ended that way is because they ran out of money. Um, this film actually was shot on a pretty low budget. Um, I mean, it could be, I mean, most of the budget went to that top. I mean, that cast was a pretty, you know, it's a pretty top heavy cast there, um, even for 1977, you know. And so, like, and it was only they only walked in with four million, only end up with a budget of six million. That's not the budget Sam Peckinpah you know, was told he was going to get or remember that's what he was told he was going to get, what have you. Uh, But they ran out of money. And so they just kind of had to come up with that ending on the spot. And I I think that was the point where Sam Peckinpah sort of just gave up on the movie. So to me, it wasn't pretentious as so much. It was like, ah, there, you were, you know, desperate. It was desperate. Well, I mean, the desperate ending, it it didn't, it was not, um, it did not feel like I got what I wanted out of it. It was an unsatisfying ending. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just talking specifically about following a film like this up with the pictures of like real atrocities and things like that. Because I understood what they were doing when they started it. But then I'd seen the whole movie and I could tell by the end, like, 
yeah, no, this isn't exactly as serious in tone in parts as that would lead you to believe. Like, I don't think a movie that has, like, some of the action sequences and some of the, just the silly stuff that was going yeah. on mm-hmm. would... I think that the- it doesn't this play. Movie, it's like throwing like Vietnam at the end of like Mash. It's not. They have a it's lot, not the same thing. There are a lot of extended action sequences than this, more so than I think either of the other two films we watched. Um, and indeed, I completely agree. I even think that. Uh, so there's this uh, criticism of Hamilton that I think has some validity, where they don't. Um, talk enough about the slavery aspect uh, of, you know, the founding fathers and all that stuff. I think that is 10 times more valid here where really, like, they don't really talk about the fact that these are all Nazis. Like, they have them occasionally well, exactly. be like, unfortunately, he's the pure. Yeah, well, it's it, the, the, yeah. the only time the Nazi party is brought up is to repudiate it, even by Stransky. Yeah, yeah, even like, the villain. It's, it's yeah, it, it, it repudiates that I mean, because, but I mean, it's it, it's the whole point of that was to kind of put you. It, it, they don't do this very often. Like Das Boot, I think, is the most successful like attempt at trying to show it from an Amer- an outsider attempt at showing it from the German perspective. Um, uh, but it, or or a uh, or, uh, crimson tide, I guess, or you know, but you know what I mean. But so it, it comes to be a point, especially at that point in the war, like it to. What I think what Sam Peckinpah was trying to show is that at that point in the war, which was, I mean, Germany just constantly just getting its ass kicked sure. by Russia on a, on a I, daily not, basis. I'm not totally unsympathetic for, to that idea for a movie. Obviously, there were a lot of people on the German side in World War II who were forced into military service, had no love for the Nazi party. But what else the fuck are you going to do? You can do this or you're going to get killed or whatever. Right. Um, but I think that right. they needed to reckon with the fact of the Nazi party and in fact that there probably would be a number of true believers mixed in there a little more heavily. The uh, and 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 considering the time of place this movie takes place in in 1943, this is right when they were ramping up the, mm-hmm. the Holocaust. This is right when they were ramping it up at warp speed. 400,000 people were being shot in Polish death camps in Denmark that summer. Uh, Denmark just got took over. But as we've stated, Germany was on the ropes in 1943. Like Italy had already fallen. They were trying. They, they now had to hold Italy um, from the allies, like as well as fighting Russia. So they were spread pretty thin. All the more reason why you should condemn the Nazi party that they allocated so many war resources for the extermination of the Jews. Um, and I think that part of the absurd concept of this plot of this, you know, unbloodied colonel seeking laurels for the losing side of a war is pretty unique and interesting and worth exploring as far as a storytelling you know i was it, it kind of reminds me of um the civil war you know if you ever watch a movie from the south's perspective i, I just watched i, I don't want to take all the credit from it but that i don't want to delve too much into it but um there's this video out there that compares gods and generals to uh the outlaw josie wales as far as showing the civil war from the perspective of the south um and how Gods and Generals is very bad, whereas Outlaw Josie Wales, while still showing the Union side as bad guys, is still pretty okay um, as far as does it really, does it whitewash the South? Sure, but what it gets at, and this is why I think this movie was so popular in Germany, is it gets a lot of the shame and regret that I think most of the German population felt about the Nazis, and it comes through in this. And that's why to make the... The, the Iron Cross, the sort of the, the MacGuffin of the movie, so to speak, um, is sort of a sick joke on that, that this military laurels, while you're constantly being bombarded all the time, just seems really silly and absurd. Um, so that's why it didn't really bother me. But I think you're completely right, Zach, that to not mention it at all, considering the time it's a miss. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it's it's a, a shocking miss. miss. Yeah, I, I would agree. It, 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 it's in like... Like I think also like one of the like it, it, the whole point of what Sam Peckinpah was trying to show was just right. You he was trying to make an anti-war film. You know he was trying to make a. I mean it's very clear that the movie is is staunchly an anti-war film. 
Um, uh, and uh, Orson Welles thought it was the finest war film he'd seen since All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, you know, take that for what it's yeah, worth. It's just, you know, okay, that's <laughs> like, great. Yeah, it, it just and my it's... problem was is that there. My problem as a whole with this movie is that there is meat in the kernel of this, there is. in the kernel of the movie, and I just think that there was some point where Peckinpah just stopped caring. I, and, I don't think. Uh, uh, one of the things I just wanted to say, um, since we're talking about this, like the basic bit in the concept of this has always seemed a little strange to me uh when i was watching it at least because i'm not sure how much of the aristocracy was still involved in um war in the way it had been because i know previous to this like if you go back to the napoleonic wars one of the big issues they had there was that people could buy military positions with their aristocracy and they would do that and then attempt to get like an iron cross or something like this guy was doing in this movie um and that often led to problems so that's one of the reasons why napoleon was sort of a new thing when he arrived because i believe he was actually a functioning soldier same thing with uh washington yeah so it was a thing where they'd sound like oh no this is someone who grows up through the ranks of the military this isn't someone who just showed up as a co and started telling people what to do um but i've also been to vivelsburg which is the um uh it's where the midnight sun is and a bunch of other things it was a location that um was essentially supposed to be like the cent- the citadel for nazis um they have a museum there now um uh, when i was there in like 2012 i wanted to see some of the exhibits and some of the things just so i could get a better understanding of it but it was interesting going through that with a german who would be of age to have seen this movie and had it play as like a modern piece um they had multiple generations. They had the generation that did it, and that generation essentially later denied any knowledge of it. And they would just say, oh, I don't know, our neighbors, they moved. Our neighbors just moved. And then that second generation was the one that felt guilt, and that's why you wind up with things like The Reader, uh, the book, not the movie, where it was all about someone who had been a Nazi guard, and it was the, the guilt coming out of that. And now you have the current generations where it's like, no, this is something that actually happened. So people are able to kind of go back and reassess that stuff. But this movie seems very strange. Right. And it I doesn't say, the seem book, like a the book was written on. Yeah. Written in 1955. Yeah. So that's so you soon know, so after he's it happened. part of that. I mean, like I said, yeah. he was he was a Nazi. The guy who wrote the fucking book was a goddamn Nazi. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, Borf, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you. Sorry. No, that's just all I want to say. It was just very strange to see this because, you know, when you talk to Germans about it, they'll talk about the fact that their parents might have been involved in the Nazi party. But it's also that Americans have this weird sense that all Nazis got arrested and sent to jail. And that's not what happened. Like everybody in the country, <laughs> also, you know, everybody in the country was required again, to be in the military. So what happens is afterwards, like a lot of people go back again, to just being bus drivers. Anyway. Let's, uh, yeah, like, I mean, again, I, I think that that is, like, finding the humanity in the beast of Nazi Germany is, I think, a perfectly valid uh, exercise. This is sort of unrelated, but, like, this is something I learned recently that I thought was fascinating. Um, so in the movie Goldfinger, the guy who plays Goldfinger was a Nazi soldier. And that movie was banned in Israel because he was a Nazi. And for a while, he was a member of the Nazi party. But... Con- Conrad Veidt? Uh, that's like the... No, his name... Uh, Gert Frobe was his name. Oh, okay. But uh, but uh, it, that came from like... Uh, what's that rag that still runs in Britain? The um, Sun. Um, the Sun. The s- and it, it came yeah. from an interview in The Sun. The part they cut from his testimony was that even though he was forced to serve in the Nazi military and as a very young man was uh, in the Nazi party and attempted to shove it off, but like couldn't because that would kill him. Yeah, that's a loud can. (laughs) He like took in a family of Jewish people and it got unbanned in Israel after one of the people he saved came forward and was like, I'm alive because this guy... Oh, wow. Yeah, this guy took me in and wow. saved me from the Holocaust. 
But so clearly there were people in the German military who were not okay with what was going on. Yeah. But I think there's a better way to do it than this movie, which I think is so slight. Uh, Especially since they were fighting Russians. I mean, and and you got to think that like part of the propaganda against the Russian machine was that they were a bunch of Jewish Bolsheviks, you know? And so Mm -hmm. you, you would think, you know, like, I know what they were trying to, they, they, it was the, it was the end of their, the, 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 like it was the end of the, the, the great and powerful Wehrmacht, you know, march to Russia. They were at this point running, running back. And so like, I can see where people aren't really in the mood. And, and it, the movie does do, do a really good job of just really showing that like everyone around there is fucking exhausted. Like, like there is not a, like nobody is like rah, rah in any direction other than just like this dude's birthday survival, you know, like mm-hmm. that's, that's yeah, his most right. song singy yeah. as they get is is this dude's birthday you know because even survival is looked on as kind of why would we do that to ourselves you know and mm-hmm. so it it, I, it, I, it does a I, really good job of just yeah. really showing just the 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 oppressive nature of just being in combat you know and and uh, I, you know yeah and i will say the you mentioned orson wells was a fan of this movie um i also read that perhaps unsurprisingly he likes most of sam peckinpah's movies Quentin Tarantino also was. This was somewhat of uh, an inspiration, as far as I'm aware, for *Inglorious Bastards*. You can kind of see I some shots. Is, you can yeah, kind of see some shots. A few moments, and yeah. I think that uh, there's um, I think that's a much better movie than this. I actually think Word. that's his best movie. Um, I concur. But the Jackie one Brown's scene, my favorite. Fair far out. Far out. <laughs> the most boring fans are. The one scene where I felt that the most was the scene between Stronsky and Treebig where he is feeling out whether Treebig is gay. Because that was an interesting non-action dialogue scene where this guy was doing this inquisitive, like, dangerous, dialogue-exclusive, like, thing, trying to, like, get dirt on this person that's extremely dangerous. And yeah. that was maybe my favorite scene in the entire movie. I thought it was very tense. Um, and, the, yeah. and the way Shell does it, too, where at first it's, you know, typical interrogation techniques. You make him your buddy, and it's like, hey, look, you know, like, who needs women? Am I right? You know, and then the turn immediately in Shell's performance and the way Pekka Paz sort of, like, pauses the, the silences in it. Um it really ramps up the tension. It, but that's the problem with this fucking movie. It's the definition of uneven. You know, there are moments in this movie, it looks like you had with uh, Alfredo Garcia. Like there are moments in this movie that I think are, are, are even enlightened surrealism. Yeah. Um, yeah. When it comes to its themes of anti-militarism, class struggle, even the homosexuality bit, you know, loyalty I, to platoon, which is a big thing of Peck and Paw. But, and then, and then you have like this sort of disinterested rote, violence you yeah, know mm-hmm. it's just sort of and it takes up a I, lot of the runtime yeah, yeah you know and it just sort of becomes rote after a while and i get that's sort of the point that war is just this hungry right, machine it, that just grinds everybody yeah, yeah. I, I think it the point he was trying to interesting to watch right I, yeah exactly i think he, he was trying to make the audience feel a little bit of what these soldiers were feeling because these barrages were happening on the hour leg, like they they had to they had to be like these soldiers didn't get the chance to cut through the next thing. So it, I mean, it, I, I'm I'm not saying it was successful. I'm just saying I think that's what he was trying to do. I sure. like and that sure. and those you know we paid for all those explosions. You know, damn it. I, I will say for being yeah, such a show them on mm-hmm. camera, God right? Damn it. Yeah, because I will say <laughs> for being went. for being such a, a strapped production. It looked okay, like it, it, like it, like it didn't for a World War Two thing. I didn't feel like it was too, like chinsed uh, out on. I thought it was going to be a lot I, worse. I would disagree. Like some of it, yes. Like when they go outside, some of the location stuff's good, but the so much of it happens in bunkers, and it's the same bunker yes, again and again. Yeah. So it it winds up looking a little bit like Mash, where they would go out with some of the military vehicles for the big ticket moments. Yes. I keep saying Mash, but it just it kept popping in my head. They'd go out for the big ticket I, military oh, moments, it. and then they would go back, and it would just be studio lighting and like closed quarters and quiet talking, and they would add all the violence and the crazy stuff in the background later. Um, yeah, I, I guess I just meant more like the ba- I thought the battle scenes were going to be really like hidden and kind of like 
Chubbs. I'm not saying he was saving Private Ryan or nothing, but I, I expected mm-hmm. the battle scenes to be a lot more chintzy, not well, to see 10 million explosions per, you know, yeah. battle scene. And yeah, the bridge, thought, the bridge explosion you know, was huge. Uh, right. And I thought, I thought this was a, a, a it's, it seemed like as far as Peckinpah is concerned, this was a wasted opportunity. Um, because again, he just kind of fell into form, didn't he? I mean, he just sort of like, okay, slow motion death, you know, like this was an opportunity to break from his form to sh- demonstrate violence on such a scale that the wild bunch can't even come close to. But I yeah. think the, the best moment as far as violence is concerned, where it really made me like even that where this tank just runs over a dead corpse that's oh, been yeah. there that was for a while was, and mean, not the good. first tank to run over that body. Mm-hmm. That's I thought I felt like there should be more images like that to more of a there was a some quiet macabre early rather than on, this, the, the return to wild bunch form. Early on, there was a memorable image of a person like stuck in some barbed wire whose back was just absolutely bloodied and gored, it, which I thought was an effective image. Um, briefly, can I talk? The, one of the most fascinating aspects of this movie to me, I mentioned him a minute ago, but I want to talk a little bit more about him, is Tree Big. Um, because, so this is a character who ultimately becomes kind of the secondary antagonist of the film. Um, he is... The Iago to, uh, to, his, to, his, to his Jafar. If you're oh, using okay. the Disney version, he said Iago. Yes. I thought Othello. I was I with was Zach. Thinking. I was with Zach. I was yeah. thought. I thought Othello. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. what? Uh, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Jafar. Uh, okay, no, you're doing no, a last. I'm sorry, but, 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 I'm not is... that erudite, guys. I'm, I, and I, I think you know that. I, I think there's two interesting things about this character. One, all three movies we've talked about, there have been varying degrees of like homosexual characters who aren't necessarily treated with like complete. They aren't treated as like you know, as pop was popular in the time is like pansies or degenerates or perverts, uh, which is interesting. And I think that's commendable. I also don't like that. This guy is a the secondary antagonist and B the person who gets like the most violently murdered because this is a dude who was blackmailed and his other option was going to Auschwitz. Well, he was like, I could either kill some Nazis who are soldiers or I could fucking go to Auschwitz for being gay. And this guy's like the most vi- shot like 400 times and then stabbed in the chest. Like, I feel I don't know, man. I I'm feel not, like I'm not. I feel like it really did the thing you were talking about last time, because there's been gay suggested subplots in the last two movies we've watched by this guy. I think mm. Um this one was not uh, subtle about it, but yeah, I totally feel the same way. I feel like it wasn't only not subtle about the character's sexuality, but it wasn't subtle about how Sam Peckinpah might have felt about that character. I mean, like, I, 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 the, it seemed I think really the, that point also rough. underscores how bad the ending is, too. Yeah. I mean, it, to me, because it's like, you know, like, Coburn, uh, uh, Steiner makes it clear that he hates all officers. He doesn't like any officers. Um, and, and despite him being a character of having some command and yet when it comes to the ending, he, he takes the poor sucker who he had to know would not have otherwise had done what he had done. Okay. And brutally murders him. And then Stransky, he's like, pick up a gun soldier, you know, let's, uh, let's go get it. You know? So it, it sort of underscores the confusion and really the, the badness of the ending. Like if, if, if Steiner had done the same to Stransky, then it's like, okay, you know, Sam Peckinpah being Sam Peckinpah. He just went mad with vengeance, you know, but right. he, with Stransky, he's just like, Fransky, nah, yeah, you know, you know yeah. like put on a, put on a helmet there, soldier, let's go out there, you know? And I don't know. I mean, yeah. So I, I think that that point underscores how shitty the ending it, ended up being. And you're right. Yeah. Like maybe, maybe they cut it, but like Stransky needed to be killed like even if you went on the battlefield like there needed to be this guy goes down hard he's like fighting for pointless valor that he's stealing for other people because he's a coward and he's afraid to face his rich ass family if he goes home like he's even if he even he for some reason they're like he's not a full-blown nazi fine i don't know why they made that choice but like he's still Might have been pretty shell. contemptible. Might, it may have been Shell. It may have been Might Shell. Have been shell, shell was pretty. He, I know he was pretty sensitive about he, it because well, he, he was, was one of the first. He was German. 
So the Austrian. Yeah. He was Austrian, yeah. and and he uh, and he he was one of the, one of the first like big German actors to come out in the '60s and the '50s. Um, won an Oscar for brilliant performance in Judgment at Nuremberg. Um, beat out my old boy Paul Newman for The Hustler. Um, you expected but, to hate him for I, I that do, too. You you expected yeah, no, to hate I loved that? Him. I I I, I love him in this movie too. I thought I thought Maximilian. <laughs> Schell, he did a good job. He, I thought the scenes between him and James he, Coburn. The I actor James was Coburn not the really, problem. No. Yeah. yeah, as with most Peck and Paul films, I have to say, uh, he knows how to get good work out of his actors. Whether you have to pull him out of his trailer in a drunken stupor or have him scream at you every five hours, um, and on this set, it, it was that. It, yeah, it, yeah. It, anyway, uh, but Coburn, I thought, really pulled in a really great performance. Even though, I mean, I'll never understand in movies where everybody speaks English but they have a German accent. You know, like, I'll, like, w- why would they speak English then? Yeah. You know, they would just speak German, you would assume. And right? I'd say Coburn's... Anyway, yeah, Coburn's well, if you're so... not going to have them speak German, why have the accent? Well, it's also a little strange because Coburn was 48 when this movie was made. So that's, this yeah, is one of those right. things that comes up. It seems like they always had way more acceptance of very, like, I would say older men playing younger tough guy parts. Um, this right. happens a lot. I don't know what it is. Like, you know, you have the your, your takens and your taking of pelham one two threes and things like that yeah, which is like an say, older Liam person Neeson's who's like action. found a new career um yeah it's just well, very strange yeah. and i yeah james coburn is t- part of that he he's one of my favorite kind of breeds of actors the sort of like interesting looking you know not handsome but interesting looking like kind of ki- ass kickers you know like you know who like lee marvin's the steve mcqueen's the you know like the uh, uh charles bronson's those kind of guys who they're not handsome by any stretch of the imagination but they're they're just fucking badasses and and, and james coburn is one in my opinion one of the more underrated ones of that cut of actor who's like he's just a guy who's just has presence you know he's talented but he's also and just this is he a, has a lot of presence just being himself in his voice you know i think this mm-hmm. is an underrated performance from from coburn you know i mean in the original book apparently steiner is supposed to be like you know 30 or like 28 or something i, I think it works better making him a grumpy grumpy old man yeah, that makes sense you know, I think it, it serves the plot a little bit better um, especially I, with I, him coming back to the battlefield after his injury it's like this guy who in a hurt locker-esque sense like this is all he has mm-hmm. yeah hmm. sorry go richard ahead. I, I real quick uh I, how often does he do dream sequences because like this kind of that, it's, do you like, count flashback sequences as dream sequences no i don't I, I, <laughs> no i don't <laughs> I kind of do, and I, it depends on how you do it. It depends on how it's presented. Like, if it's presented as if the, if they're, you know, if it's like a waking dream, like they're thinking about it and it's presented in terms of, like, the, 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 uh, the quick cuts when he is blown up and everything of that nature, it's sort of like showing time kind of compressing and standing still because it's just, like, like I yeah, said, to no, me, the no, most. I got that. But, uh, like, he doesn't, the, the only time he ever shows, like, this is the only time I've ever seen someone like doing a thing where they're falling asleep. It mostly occurs in like flashback of someone kind of thinking about things. Um, but it's not okay because they kind of reminded me of of Papillon, you know, like the kind of surreal quiet of it. You know, there's a lot of scenes in Papillon where Steve McQueen is like dreaming of the trials and everything, and it, it kind of reminded me of that. I've never seen Peck and Pod do that. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and I I don't know I I there's a lot going on with this movie. I mean, like for I I will say every Peck and Paul movie we've watched, with the exception of Wild Bunch, because I've seen it before, uh, it's not what I expected. I I yeah. really did not expect it to be this anti-militarism. I didn't expect the the very obvious class struggle going on with it. Um, I expected the loyalty to the platoon. That's Peck and Paw. You sure. know, that's but, but there was a lot of uh, post traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, right. Um, I, when when he went into the hospital, I sort of thought like, oh, so this is what the rest of the movie is going to be. Like, I, I sort of thought like, and I, honestly, how much cooler would that have been? If like, how much I, more I think focused? We should yeah talk about that sequence, both in terms of. Uh, the post-traumatic stress, which I think continues and maybe his addiction to like this life because it's all he knows, which does work better because he's older, but also Eva, who is another character who's like an angel who he repudiates her offer. And the character is gone. She's played by Senta Berger. 
who played also age inappropriate relationship. Yes, another classic yes. Peckham. Um, well, she was she was kind of she played so she Santa she was played by Santa Berger, and she that was her second Pe- Peckinpah film. Her first one was Major Dundee, where she played pretty much the exact same character: a person who nurses a war soldier back to life, tries to convince him not to leave, and he doesn't. You know, yeah. it's almost exactly the same. It's a, beats. It's a meeting, meeting with the goddess. This is what it yeah. is later. Yeah. Meeting with the goddess, and then it's a denial of the goddess, and then they go off to continue having the adventure. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like so, if yeah. this movie had the ending that maybe Peck and Paul wanted, where Stransky dies, and then probably I imagine Steiner also dies, maybe he'd have a vision of Eva at the end or some shit mm, like that. Yeah. Well, let me let me ask like you a question. I've always found interesting because everybody else seems to enjoy Inglorious Bastards more than I do. How does this film compare to Inglorious Bastards? Because it's the worse. tone and the context, <laughs> way well, worse. The tone and the context. That's the question I have because you have like funny moments in Inglorious Bastards and big over the top weird moments, but it's talking about something serious. Whereas this one seems to just sort of bungle talking about serious things, and it has funny stuff in it as well, but. For some reason in this one, it felt, it seems like it's more offensive than when it's in Inglorious Bastards. So one of the biggest problems that this movie has that Inglorious Bastards doesn't is that in Inglorious Bastards, fuck Nazis. Like that's the premise of the movie. It's fuck Nazis. And this is, we're on the German side, so it's complicated like it makes it harder yeah. in some mm. ways yeah I'm, I'm rooting for the communists i I, yeah. I hate to say it sorry i'm rooting for the communists um but i I'll, i'm gonna be contrary to that i i think i i i to no, know i can't say that this movie was better because this movie's got a lot of problems to it but but what i do appreciate about cross fire more than inglorious bastards is anti-war and anti-militarism. Sure. Um, I mean, there the anti-war sentiment in this movie is dripping. He's as poor said, he's not subtle about it. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. there's that scene between David Warner and James Mason. What are we going to do when we lose the war? We'll prepare for the next one. Yeah, like that's that's what the the war machine, the consulate wrote violence is. But that's why that- I think this film actually achieves Peck and Pa's worldview of violence. That violence is actually bad. But he just, like I said, just is lazy about it. And, and, and it just kind of returns to form. That is also difficult in terms of comparison, because the thing about Inglorious Bastards is it takes place during World War II. It is not a war film. There no. are no more of a spy film. It's really. a war really film is. in the same way, like Hateful Eight's a Western. You know, yeah. it's like it's nothing but the setting. You know, it, it's it, like it, it's, it, it's there are it, no battlefield scenes. In right. That movie. Right. None. Yeah. yeah, and that's why. And, and, and honestly, had this film had less battle scenes, probably be a lot better. Uh, I don't know about that because be then we would be stuck uh, with the kind of like not very, not very focused dialogue. Because the like, I'm just saying, I could have done with uh, one or two tanks not exploding <laughs> to finish the movie. <laughs> I, 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 I think to just, ans- my my response to priorities. my response to Vorf about the comparison to Inglorious Pass. I mean, a lot of the visual style. Uh, you can definitely see, like, there's the. the sp- I'm thinking the seamer mm-hmm. coming out of the trees. Like, I I saw them. I go, I saw that in the glorious bastards, you know. Uh, but I, I I'm trying to think, and I, again, I'm not a war movie expert. I'm not much of an any movie expert, but uh, it, like, war movies don't really have like a lot of like sit down dialogue scenes. You know, they're mostly quick and utilitarian. Maybe a one one or two reprise. This one much like Inglorious Bastards does have for better or worse, better in my opinion, Inglorious Bastards than Cross of yes. Iron um, uh, is it does have a lot of long kind of back and forths, you know, and those and, were my favorite parts of this movie. And they're my favorite parts of that movie too. Like yeah. I don't, uh, whatever. There's a scene where they shoot Hitler a bunch with a machine gun. That's all well and good. The really great stuff is like the longer dialogue tension scenes and this tree big scene that happens early in this film that felt similar to me. All right. That's respectable. I, you know, and I, it's, it is. And that's why I, I, I probably have to still give it to Inglorious Bastards because Cross of Iron is such a mess. But I, I, I do think that this is probably a peck and paw movie that is dying to be remade by somebody. Um, I, I think that you could actually tell this story better than what Peck and Paw put out. And my first vote is David Simon. 
Um, I think David Simon could probably take the story and probably make it uh, for for all the anti-war, anti-militarism, class struggle themes that are throughout this story. I think somebody with not so much of a grasp on a bottle of Jack Daniels um, would. I, I mean, he he did this to I make mean, money. I mean, this was a money making. He he was broke. Well, I mean, no, he honest, did he did all is, of his movies to make money. Don't make if this any is, mistake. <laughs> If this is already a metaphor for Vietnam and uh, an imperialist class that people are unwillingly serving, then Simon already did this. He made Generation Kill. Yep. Yeah. I, yeah that's true. That's true. I, I, I See, do. What I, would I don't. Want di- is I don't... an Aaron Sorkin World War II movie. It would just be a walk and talk. <laughs> They'd just be walking and talking in circles around the bunker. Cross of Aaron yeah. Sorkin's a cross of iron. That's I'm right. in. Uh-huh. <laughs> everybody, everybody knows the entire songbook of Gilbert and Sullivan. Nobody doesn't know it. They know the whole songbook of Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, yeah, that, that would be. But mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I, I just well, felt like I, I like I like I said. It reminded me of the outlaw Josie Wales, where you're showing the losing side of a conflict. Um, and I think there's a lot to there's a lot of meat on the bone. And again, that Peckapa kind of left on there. There's plenty, again, yeah, like there's those Vietnam shots at the end. There are Vietnam movies about people who did terrible things in Vietnam on the losing side of a conflict, the imperialistic side of a conflict. I mean, Apocalypse Now is a movie that exists. And yes, in my opinion, it's quite I, good. Yes, and, and, and I think that uh, that was a lot of the criticism of this movie at the time, that there are a lot of movies that say the same thing that Cross of Iron says that do it better, and Peckinpah himself has done it better. Uh, so, I, yeah, and, and it's hard to deny that. I mean, even it, again, a constant theme you always hear about with Sam Peckinpah, and even Gene Siskel had to say it. Why did he make this movie? Um, you know, and and again, the three films like me, we've done, all that has been that question has been asked to him for all three of the films that we've done for Wild Bunch, Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, and Cross of Iron. The question: Why'd you do this? Yeah. Why? Yeah. So. So I guess um, before we go too long, because we still have some voting to do, let's close the book on Sam Peckapon. Unless you guys got some final thoughts that you want to go through. With I have one. Mo- Iron? I have one final. Did you guys know that he turned down King Kong and Superman to do this movie? So Sam Peckinpah could have beaten Zack Snyder to the cut by about <laughs> almost a half a century. You know, like <laughs> well, I would have preferred it because you know what? I'll tell you the difference. Zack Snyder is a 15-year-old nihilist. Um, he loves George Miller and all that like reductive female archetype shit. But at his heart, Frank, Frank he's Miller. an Ayn Frank Miller. Rand, Frank Miller. But at his heart, he's an Ayn Rand fanboy. And Peckinpah, at least, <laughs> like he had more going on intellectually than fucking Zack Snyder. He's, I'm sorry. Maybe the worst director working today. If I get nothing else out of that, which, yeah, message. Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're not going to have arguments. Is maybe the worst, like ideologically, one of the worst movies I've ever seen. That's fascist propaganda. I, I would have thought you would have said Watchmen just because the source material is so good and the output being so bad. That's also is, terrible. You know, like they, yeah, he really idolizes, he clearly idolizes Rorschach, the fascist character. Yeah. Like 300 is another level. It's <laughs> right. Yeah. 300 yeah. was shown to people yeah. who were being shipped out. Thank you. Yeah. To go the, fight, uh, go fight in Muslims. The Iraqi yeah. war. Yeah. To yeah. Like, gear them up to kill. They weren't showing foreigners. Watchmen. To fucking, you know, get people all yeah. sopped up to go fight Iraqis, you know? <laughs> yeah, every once in a while, there's, like, something that just kind of hits the, uh, the zeitgeist of sort of jingoist nonsense. Uh, sometimes you have your... Somehow it's always Starship Frank Miller. Troopers. Hmm. The book Starship Troopers. Oh, yeah. Oh, to the forget Robert Heinlein. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, let's not forget Robert Heinlein. <laughs> the, we um, have more nuclear bombs. More, the adaptation more of bombs. Starship Troopers is the opposite of the adaptation of Watchmen. Those are yes. both yeah, movies yeah. where... The movie and the book have the opposite message, and yeah, you know, I would say they're equal yeah. in terms of quality. Um, uh, the movie's like, fine. Oh, it's just it, oh, the movie's fine if you view it as a satire. <laughs> oh, yeah. you, all right, all right, you, easy, Paul you, Verhoeven fan you. I know, mm. I know, I know, I know, I know. All right, so before let's before we figure out what we're doing next time around well, well, i we, am going should to we, uh, should we do the final thoughts first because i yeah, yeah but first let should. me i have two more points to give and i'm okay. going to give them to both my co-hosts for suffering through 
this clearly rigged um, <laughs> that's theme very, that I did. That's um, very gracious. You know, but I, I am glad you guys did it with gusto. You know, we really did. I, I feel like I know Richard's not thrilled about um, you know, we just pretty much stuck with later day Peck and Paul, but he can fuck himself. <laughs> yeah. um, I, 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 I'm proud of you guys for going. So it's a point each you know, for both of you. And I'm going to actually, I think I have one left to give. Is that correct, Russell? That is mm-hmm. correct. I'm going to give one to Richard, our first three-peat guest. <laughs> he doesn't get a vote. Oh. I'll take it. I'll take I, it. I believe I, this was an argument we had at the start of this where I wanted to give Richard points, and you I gave me a, you gave me a talking to. <laughs> That's how much I've pissed you guys off. You guys will give your points to a person who's not going to be in the vote. <laughs> <laughs> just so I don't have to have the point. Well, here's the thing. I'm going to give you my remaining point as well, Carlson, because you made us watch this. And I'm giving it to you not because you made a good point. I'm giving it to you out of spite. <laughs> I'm giving you a point out of spite. Spite point. <laughs> I'm just going to hold on to my last one, actually. Spite point. There we go. Okay, and so let's move on to final thoughts. I'll let you guys go first, since and and you could give in your final thoughts about Peck and Paw writ large if you want. But uh, I'll I'll go last since this was my theme. I picked this movie out. I picked it out because there was a limited list. I did my best, but I wish I had picked Convoy to be quite honest. Because with Convoy, <laughs> at least we would have known what we were doing going in, and it would have been a fun time watching Chris Christopherson. In this case, I had a good time with parts of this movie. I didn't enjoy all this movie. Some of it was very strange. Um, the one sequence that I liked and I think other people liked was the uh, sort of surrealist sequences that happened in the hospital. Uh, reminded me of a movie I like a lot, which Carlson hates, uh, Carnival of Souls. Um, the, the ending of Carnival of Souls, because there's a lot of people in a room and then there's suddenly no one in yeah. a room and it's very interesting. Um, mm-hmm. But I would not suggest this movie really to anybody. Um, outside of just completionists. Because if you really want to see all this guy's stuff, go for it. There's some fun sequences. Not a really great movie overall. Uh, and pretty uneven. So that's that's my thoughts. Yeah, there, there are moments in this movie that I enjoy. Uh, I've talked about them previously in this podcast. You can hear what they are. Uh, one thing I didn't probably emphasize quite enough is how many war sequences there are that become very dulling after a while like and maybe that's the point but still as a viewing experience it's not great so that really like i feel like 40 percent of this movie is just long sequences of battles and explosions and people getting shot and it for a two hour and like 15 minute movie spending nearly an hour in that it's just like okay we can we can keep going uh so yeah there are things that about about this that are interesting i wish the ending had landed i wish there were a version of this ending that were like fuller and maybe what peck and paw wanted if it is the case that he had to cut it short um because that ending is not satisfying um but there's elements of it I, I I enjoy. It's definitely not the worst thing we've watched. It's not, it's not terrible. It's just not very good. I I I think the most complimentary I can be to this as as a guy who sees most of Peck and Paw movies through through positive glasses is that uh, the best the best review I've I've read is that it's a hard film to like. You know, it's it, it it's you can see where he wanted you can see where there was there was the start of an idea of a good movie there and a part of me almost wishes he made it like five years earlier you know mm-hmm. like if he i feel like if he had made it when he just hadn't had like the past decade happen to him you know in terms of just battling studios battling himself battling himself some more you know um uh it, it like i think that it would have been really interesting to see one of the reasons why james coburn even signed on to do this film is he because he said why you know sam why are you doing this film and sam says well i've never done a world war ii film and james Once coburn again, the yeah. question never never seems to go away yeah and james coburn just said you know what sam i'd like to see you do a, a world war ii film and i think like at the time i would have but it normally with sam peckinpah sometimes as 
like even Zach kind of alluded to with bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia. Sometimes his failures are more interesting than his successes. Um, that's not the case with cross of iron, you know, like I, I watched uh, the, the other failure I watched of his was just recently to try to compare it to was major Dundee. Um, and that had a lot of the same problems, very bloated, very lot of extraneous battle scenes or whatever. But the difference was I can just tell that Sam Peckinpah gave a shit, you know, during the shooting. And it's just like, I can tell that there was a point and I don't know exactly where it happens. Like in chronology in the movies, but then in the, some point in the production of the movie, Sam Peckinpah just said, fuck it. And that's what you got in the movie. That's why it's such an unsatisfactory ending. And frankly, uh, yeah, it, I, I was disappointed with it, but I think Borf nailed it on the head. The only reason to watch this is if you're just a completionist. Sure. Otherwise, there's 10 other movies that do what they're this is trying to do much, much better. I'm a little softer on this movie than you guys are. I, I there's there's a part of me that that kind of likes it despite its messiness. Uh, you know, I, 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 I know it's our favorite hobby horse, Borif, but it reminds me of the prisoner, you know, which is another uneven, incomplete mess. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but I, I am charmed by the moments of brilliance yeah. enough to sit it. through this movie. However, that does not mean I would recommend it. Cause I've gotten in trouble for that before. Um, yeah. That being said, I, 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 I kind of liked it. Um, it's not what I was expecting. I appreciate the very, very anti-war sentiments that are all over this movie and the anti-militarism. Um, but again, I think you guys are mostly right. It's a missed opportunity for Peckinpah to really kind of do something different. And then to just kind of, I think Richard said the best, the disinterest in this movie is very, very evident. Like there's, the, you, there was points, he was interested in certain moments of this movie rather than the whole movie. You know, he was far more interested in the little bits of trees rather than the whole forest. Um, and, and I think that intercutting that with the sort of rote, you know, orgy of violence that underpins Peck and Pa's philosophy of violence, this is a good opportunity to really hammer at home. And he kind of does, but doesn't really he kind of whiffs on it. Um, so, yeah, it just, like like we kind of said with with Alfredo Garcia, there's flashes of brilliance in this movie that I think in the end is still just a disjointed, confusing mess. That being said, I kind of liked it. Uh, and finally, I, I just want to say that uh, viewers, uh, listeners and viewers, um, you're watching this f- months later, but for us, it's, uh, you know, it's two days before the inauguration of Joe Biden and, you know, not long after the raid on the Capitol and who knows what will happen at the inauguration. Maybe nothing, hopefully nothing, but we may not be in the best mood to watch the softer side of fascism right now. <laughs> I tell you, I was not in the mood to watch it last Wednesday. I had the day off yeah. and I just put on cross iron. Yeah. I'm like, no, no, I can't. I can't. Yeah. And like I said, the movie is not pro Nazi per se, but I just, I'm like, nah, not today. When you're, when you're highlighting the heroic deeds of a, of one front <laughs> while ignoring the furnace of bodies at home, it, it, there is a little bit of apologia there, and then that's where I'm. I I I understand Zach's point. To not mention yeah. it at all is yeah. pretty telling. It's still glamorous when you kill a bunch of people <laughs> in the name of the Holocaust, even if you don't support <laughs> exactly. the Holocaust. You're still right. great. What? I I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I uh, it. I was watching it while the raid happened. That was one of the things that came up because I had to kind of like <laughs> yeah. stop. Okay. Listener, this was fun. Um, so Chris was <laughs> like, I don't know if I like this pick. And I was like, Chris, there's an armed <laughs> standoff at the, the U.S. Capitol right now. <laughs> like, and literally. Chris just wrote back, oh, that seems more important. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, are we ready to vote? How many points does everybody have? Okay, to run down the points real quick. Chris Boreff, you have 13 points to divvy out. I have 12 points. And Zach Powers, you have 15 points to divvy out. Holy shit, I did well this time. Yeah, you really banked him this time. And he even kept his own bonus point. I thought Uh, I had 14. That's okay. You know what, Russell? I'll give you one. Oh, no, you do a 14. You do a 14. You do a 14. Russell, I'm going to give you one just because. Fuck it. Okay. (laughs) Damn it. I've right. I've I've seen the the spirits of Christmas past, present, and future. <laughs> I can't take it with me. What day is it? What day is it, young Did man? Did I watch Christmas Day? <laughs> okay, so for the first movie of Peck and Paw, The Wild Bunch, Chris Boreff, what you got? 
I gave the wild bunch a five. Okay, and I gave the wild bunch a six. I also gave the wild bunch six. So that comes out to uh, 17 for the wild bunch. Yes, that is right. Okay, Borif. What you got for Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia? For Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, I gave it a seven. And that is the severed head of Alfredo Garcia drawn on the card. (laughs) For the listeners who can't see this, because you should also follow us on YouTube. (laughs) Um, Okay, I gave the head of Alfredo Garcia a four. I gave the head of Alfredo Garcia a six also. So, uh, yeah. 17, we are tied. Wow. Oh, God. <laughs> tied at 17. Here we go again. Well, Crossfire well, is not going to win. Why we've got Riffs. This is why we've this got why we Richard. Richard. Yeah, Cross of Iron ain't going to win. <laughs> so, all right, Borf, what you got for Cross of Iron? For Cross of Iron, I gave it a two. Uh, I giving Cross of Iron a three. I also gave Cross of Iron a three. So, Cross uh, of Iron does not win, but... We have a tie, gentlemen. We have a tie. And we have a guest guest. so Mm. fortuitously to break our tie. So I, the twin brother of one of the people in contention, uh, will be an unbiased and right down the middle. uh, uh, You're you're the the tiebreaker. You can't be unbiased. You are as biased as it gets. You are the tiebreaker right now. Oh, man. So I have have to choose point. I'm, I'm having to choose between Wild Bunch and Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. Correct. Mm-hmm. Mm. And, God damn uh, it! I, yeah. I, you know what? You see, you see, you have to, you have to view the whole score. This is yeah. like when they go on, um, when you go on Great British Bake Off. It's not that final Bake Off that counts. Yeah. It's all it's the those entire. previous bakes. So here, and, here is what I'll say. One of my favorite quotes from is, Sam. This is just to stop b- before you announce. Russell's horrible anti-democratic plan is in turmoil right now. <laughs> this is this is the Republicans you at the are, Georgia runoff. You are Georgia, sir. Yeah, I know. You Russell, yeah, Russell, yeah, Russell's now calling, calling me. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm, I'm notified. You, the you are notified. Find Let's the votes, not talk Richard. about all the superfluous points. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm just saying the 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 union will exist after this has occurred. So <laughs> if if the wrong points are given out, I will be open to doing whatever my moral imperative is and as I'm far as films honest, are concerned. Henceforth, I will be carrying my gun to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Metal detectors. Uh, <laughs> uh, so. Or like freedom remover. Yeah. <laughs> so I here's the thing. I Sam, one of my favorite quotes from Sam Peckinpah is one of the things that he wanted out of life was what his dad used to say was that he wanted to walk into his house justified at the end of the day. And while Wild Bunch is an objectively, I think, better film than Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, I'm gonna give it to Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. Just because it wouldn't feel like justice if I gave it to the Wild Bunch. Um, because Russell did y'all dirty by choosing the Wild Bunch. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, like, it's just, if if, if, if Peckinpah hated anything, uh-huh. it was the man who rigged the system. Yeah, th- yeah he would not stand uh-huh. for this sort of that shenanigans. Sam Peckinpah. And, and, yeah, and especially if it was, and it's not like Zach chose Convoy. You mm-hmm. know, it's not like we're between mm-hmm. Wild Bunch and the Osterman weekend. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia. I mean, it's not like Pat Aaron Billy the Kid or Ride the High Country, Ballad of Cable Hogue, I mean, even Major Dundee. Why Sam Peckinpah kids, but I have to say that I will give it to, I'm giving it to Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia in the interest of justice and in the interest of bravery of picking Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. So, that is my decision. Gavel. So brave we couldn't even find it. <laughs> um... All right. Well, that's. I mean, a, a justice is served. I, I, you know, I, I sort of knew what I was doing when I, when I, when I suggested the peck and pop theme, and then taking the wild bunch you're off gonna, the board. You're gonna, I, you're gonna feel relieved when you, you find my pick for the theme because it's not even really my pick. Okay. Um. All righty, Zach. What is it? Now, for the listeners, it's past this time, but for us, it's coming up on. Uh, St. Valentine's Day, 
And I have chosen for my pick, not that we choose the movie, but that our significant others choose the film for us. That's a great idea. And uh, I've asked, I've asked Shannon ahead of time what she wants. And I think it would be fun if we can manage to get them on here. If not, that's fine too. But I think, you know, just for the sake of, you know, we'll see what we can do. Mm -hmm. Shannon has chosen Bugsy Malone. I mean, it's not like she didn't warn us. It's Bugsy oh, Malone. Man. I haven't seen this uh, yeah. movie in probably 30 years. What a I tone think, shift. I, those are one of those movies. Those are one of those movies that like, Richard, you remember when like mom like wax the floor or whatever. And we'd have to stay in the in the living room because we couldn't walk on the linoleum. And she would just put on one of the, I think that's like some musical or some shit. So I think that's our first time seeing that's how I recognize the song. Um but yeah, I haven't seen it in. I, I I couldn't even. Wow, yeah, that'll be different. Yep. Yeah. So Bugsy Malone, uh, you guys do the do the reconnaissance. Figure out what uh, your significant others uh, want to watch for this particular round. If they want to guest, if that's possible. Um, yeah. Yeah. This okay. sounds awesome. Um, it's going to be yeah, exciting I, to see I, what uh, what we get be handed to us to watch. Yeah, and they they don't have the 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 state of play that the they we don't do, care. So sort of they you know, do yeah, not exactly. care. Yeah, yeah will exactly. Bugsy Malo win? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> what if fun. it does though? What if it does? Yeah, what if it's know. what if we find out that Bugsy Malone in all these years we haven't been watching it has aged beautifully hey. like fine wine and it has a deep people, political message. It's got a big anti cop message and <laughs> people in England legitimately love this movie. It's a really? classic in England. Not a joke. Hmm. Yeah, very truly. Wow. All right. Insane. Well, I mean, their cuisine doesn't inspire me yeah. in much confidence. But so that's we'll uh, <laughs> so that's our new round, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I think this is going to round us out for this for this uh, trio of movie trap episodes. I really want to yeah. extend a lot of thanks to Richard Carlson, who, who who I'm glad got to be the tiebreaker. Yeah, I'm actually mm-hmm. very proud. He he went he went with us on this journey and he got his vote in. I <laughs> thank you DC for being statehood on. for Richard Carlson. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I I I, I want to thank Richard as well because I when I kind of pitched the idea to him, he he kind of frothed at the mouth a little bit because he didn't say I don't trust you guys to talk about fucking. Um, so, <laughs> and I still and, don't. <laughs> Cross of iron, come on, Bora. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks a lot, Richard. It's been a hey, lot of fun guiding us through the, the big fan podcast. of the podcast. Always have been. Love coming on. Thanks for having me, guys. I really, really appreciate you uh, talking some peck and pot with me. I, I had a blast. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for uh, being on. That's gonna do it. That's gonna do it for us. Uh, once again, thank you to Richard Carlson. Uh, as for the rest of us, I've been Zach Powers, as always, joined by Russell Carlson. See you later, and always wonder, why did we make this? And Chris Bora. Don't let the door hit you where the Lord split you. Next time, we'll see you in the first of our round four significant others movie picks with Bugsy Malone. (laughs) And uh, as always, the movie trap promise, Diane Ladd is too young to be Chevy Chase's mom. (laughs) (laughs) This is my adjutant, Captain Kiesel. Captain, how are you? Thank you for asking, Captain. I feel terrible. I've got diarrhea. How are you? <laughs>